All views expressed in this call are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute investment advice. We urge you to please consult an investment professional before making any investment decisions to ensure that they fit within your risk tolerance and investment suitability. For those of you joining us live and the number of you joining us on the replay, thank you for sharing your time with us and joining us for our My Wealth video series. My name is Jeff Hunter. I'm a portfolio manager with the Townsend, Simone and Hunter Group at Canaccord Genuity. And also on the line is our lead investment advisors, Dave Townsend and Raheem Samani. For more about uh, our team and our plans, please check out mywealthmanager.ca. Today's call is with Tanya Gonsalves. Tanya is a vice president of research and an analyst covering the Canadian healthcare industry. Previously, Tanya worked in an independent dealer for almost four years, most recently as an analyst covering the healthcare sector. Prior to her role as an analyst, she spent one year in institutional sales covering a variety of U.S. industries. And Tanya holds a high honors bachelor of science specialist in molecular biology from the University of Toronto as a CFA charter holder. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. We have muted participants, but in the chat below, please feel free to direct any questions to Dave, Raheem, or myself. We'd be more than happy to ask them on your behalf. Uh, and today's call will be recorded, so check your emails in the coming days for the replay information or follow our team's Facebook page at facebook.com slash mywealthmanager.ca. With that, I'll pass it off to Raheem Samani. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, Tanya, thank you very much for your time. We know how incredibly busy you are. Uh, so we'll uh, just get started. Uh, if you just want to summarize a little bit about your coverage space and what you're working on, uh, I could give our uh, viewers and listeners a little bit of a caption on what you're covering and what your day-to-day -day entails. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks so much, Raheem. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you guys here today. So I cover, um, I used to be a pure play healthcare analyst. Um, my coverage has somewhat expanded in the last few months to become a little bit more diversified. So now you could call me a health and wellness analyst, and that um, encompasses your traditional healthcare names. So in Canada, that is the specialty pharmaceutical companies, which I'll get a little bit more into uh, later, if time permits, as well as uh, medical device companies and services companies. The majority of healthcare, I would say, if it's not specialty pharmacy, um, even, the, even the stocks listed on the TSX are, are US-based businesses. So I'm, I'm pretty used to covering US companies. Um, more recently, however, my coverage has expanded to include wellness, which um, I'm sure you're all aware is um, a very, very hot topic right now. Um, the mushroom coffees and plant-based meats and um, all these fitness trackers. So, so anything in the wellness spectrum, um, as well as most recently psychedelics. So anything from the drug developers on that side uh, to the clinics, which are, which are kind of young at this moment. Um, right now, most of the clinics that we see are ketamine clinics and the drug developers are all pretty much in phase one or two, um, if not preclinical, so very early stage. Um, but the business models are akin to biotech. So um, I, I like not to compare them to the cannabis market and we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Um, but I, I like to compare them to and value them as I would a biotech stock. But I'll leave it there. Perfect. So I'll leave psychedelics and plant-based uh, for Dave to uh, to touch on in a few minutes. But if you could sum up 2020 in one word, uh, considering that most of us uh, or some of us have been at home, but a lot of us are working 15, 18 hours a day through the pandemic, what would a healthcare analyst summarize 2020 as? Um, I think just really unpredictable. The like the the market crash that we saw earlier this year, nobody could have anticipated how far, how far we fell. And then coming back, the all-time highs that we see right now, I don't think it was predicted by anyone really, especially not me. I did not think this would last so long, which is terrible. I'm a healthcare analyst. I should have seen this, but yeah, unpredictable. So then basing off that, in speaking with CEOs and company executives for 2021, uh, what are some key things that they're focused on? We've heard everything from top line revenue is going to be a very determining factor, uh, cash balances, credit. Uh, what are some of the themes that they're focused on, which could help uh, our clients and friends on the line better gauge 
the sector as it moves forward? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So I'd say this year, for healthcare companies at least, this year everyone was focused on cash balance. Shore up the balance sheet in case things get worse, in case revenues really plummet and we're not making any free cash flow. Let's let's get some debt, even if we don't need it. Let's raise some cash, even if we don't need it, just to make sure our coffers are, are, are full in a worst case scenario. Next year, um, I would say everyone's focused on bringing that top line revenue back. And most of the healthcare companies, um, how they do that is expanding the business model a little bit to include virtual healthcare. So you've all seen like telemedicine, digital health have really just like done phenomenally these last few months. Everyone in my space too that does not have a digital health platform is working to get one. They're working on incorporating telemedicine um, into their traditional business model, uh, which, I, which I think is important. I don't think it's going anywhere now. Are there any other trends in in technology that healthcare companies are incorporating as we move forward outside of telemedicine? It's been probably one that's been most on the horizon or in front of people. But is, are there um, things in the background that are percolating that are used that you're seeing? Well, it's all within the digital space, uh, digital health space. I would say, like telemedicine is more so. How do you reach out to those consumers and make healthcare available to them virtually? But in in the background, on the provider side, we're seeing a lot more work being done on um, tracking and analyzing patient data as best as you can. Whether that means uh, you like some of these companies are working on using AI. It's still very very early, but how can we have uh, better? Um, how can we better our system so that? Healthcare is preventative versus actually treating the disease. How do we come in before and predict when it's going to happen and prevent that occurrence from ever happening to reduce costs to the system? Because one thing that's talked about um, very frequently is, is the cost of healthcare. It's incredibly onerous on the system. How do we get those costs down? Um, yes, I will leave it there. <laughs> so AI, uh, in addition to uh, telehealth care, so really trying to understand the consumer and looking at the cost constraints and et cetera. So a theme that has come up previously in another call with analysts, uh, there are gold analysts and our banking analysts, I'm gonna ask you as well, is the role of ESG. Uh, it's being utilized. I don't think many people understand it and that's okay because you know analysts are there to help us. But in your position, you know what's the role of ESG amongst healthcare companies? Is it prevalent? Are you getting more and more feedback on it? Are, are the questions being asked around it? Yeah, so we, our research department as a whole did put out an ESG piece earlier this year, which I would highly recommend everyone read just to see the top names in each sector um, from an ESG perspective. In healthcare, because a lot of the Canada domicile, like the TSX listed healthcare names are quite small still, like they're not, you're, you're, two billion plus dollar companies they're not they're still early in their esg strategies which is unfortunate but everyone knows that it's something that's very topical so they are working on it the um the diversified board of directors i think that's a commonality that comes first it's very easy to incorporate all different ethnicities as well as women on your board of directors and in your management teams what is a little bit slower is how how do we incorporate that e of esg the environmental into our business models especially if you're a specialty pharmaceutical company what can you really do from an environmental perspective? Maybe you can make your packaging a little bit more environmentally friendly, but there's not a, a lot of obvious things that you can do. Um, so, so working on like char charitable donations, things like that are front of mind. Those are easy to, to implement right away. On the wellness side, however, that's much easier. So companies um, like Burpon, which is a company I cover, environment, that environmental aspect is very big to them. They they have a JV uh, partnership, this company called Merit, which is going to be the, the first producer of canola protein and the commercial producer of canola protein in the world. They're developing, uh, producing pea protein out of this facility as well. That plant is expected to be carbon neutral, I believe by 2022. So that's a big focus of theirs. Um, Jameson as well is working on 
reducing the cost Jameson Wellness is, is the vitamin company, reducing uh, packaging, so the environmental impact of their packaging, as well as looking at what kind of manufacturing processes they can put in place to be as environmentally friendly as possible. And they also do a lot of charitable work. So the wellness companies, I would say, are a lot further along than the healthcare companies are. That's some good perspectives. And, and in your coverage universe, uh, how many companies do you currently cover? Um, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I believe it's 13. I just joined a year ago, so I've been in ramp mode. It's constantly changing. And I I, believe- that's, that's good. Your, your, your space is growing and your profile has definitely grown. And out of that coverage space of 13 companies, can you highlight maybe one or two that you believe are, I'm, and we're not going to hold you to it, like our top picks, but our most exciting uh, in terms of watching their development, uh, especially over the last year, because companies have had to pivot, navigate, and move forward. Um, what are the companies that are moving into 2021 that have you most excited? Yeah, um, so very topical, good timing. Our department just put out a topic report this week. So my topic highlighted in that report was a company called Burke Financial Sciences, which I uh, previously mentioned. They are, um, a developer. So they're more so an R&D company. They develop plant-based proteins. And these are proteins that can be used in plant-based milks. They can be used in plant-based ice creams. They can be used in plant-based um, meat products. So for instance, Beyond Meat Burger, that, that product uses pea protein in it. Um, they do not produce soy because soy, as we all know, has a lot of negative headlines around it. People are trying to consume less soy. So they are very much so focused on pea and canola to begin with. Um, like I said, they are an R&D company, but they partnered with some gentlemen who, who came from the hemp seed world and have had good success in commercialization before. They, two of them founded uh, or were executives at Manitoba Harvest. So if any of you use Manitoba Harvest products. I know I do in my smoothie every day. So that was nice to see someone um, whose, whose name I recognize. So they, they formed this JV called Merit Functional Foods. And Merit um, is building a brand new protein production plant. So they take raw um, yellow peas, raw canola, and process that into protein isolates. And one of the, the really interesting things about this is there is a massive supply and demand imbalance today like I think um, when Beyond Meat wanted to launch their their burgers in Europe, one of the things that delayed that timeline was the fact that they could not get access to sufficient quantities of pea protein. That's been the bottleneck for a lot of these plant-based food companies. Um, so having a brand new plant come online to help with that supply demand imbalance, I, I think it's going to ramp up right away. Um, this plant is slated to start producing protein and start generating revenue ja- in January, so very, very near term. And there's been a lot of hype around this stock um, through the year, just in, anticip- in anticipation of that. It's up, I believe, about 200% year to date already. Um, you had Nestle sign on as a customer. You had the Canadian government um, lend a bunch of money to the company. So I think they they got, including the Canadian government grants and debt, as well as some private financing, they, they were able to raise almost $100 million this year. And Trudeau even spoke about the need for new plant proteins and mentioned merit in one of his talks. So it really brought Canadian eyes to the story. And it is Canadian, it's based in Winnipeg, um, used Canadian ingredients, processed in Canada. So a very a national, something to be proud of here in Canada. Um, and then they also got a $30 million investment by a company called Boongi, which is a multinational giant agribusiness. So having someone like that back them who has really a really global focus and like long-term expertise in, in commercialization, um, supplies the raw input, buys the end product, I think it makes sense for them to end up acquiring that, acquiring Merit down the line, which I speculate could happen next year. I've speculated that in my research. Um, and I think if that happened, that would be really, really exciting and, and great, a great catalyst for work on. Fantastic. So there's an enterprising Canadian story that's just in our backyard and uh, making <laughs> phenomenal inroads. Uh, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I know uh, plants and psychedelics are of key uh, note and themes that people have been looking forward to for this call. So I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Raheem. Uh, first of all, Tanya, thank you very much for your time. I'm kind of looking at this sector and going, do we do we take this into three buckets on the psychedelic side? Like we have the clinics 
which are going to be one, you know, aspect of business, uh, like field trip. And then we have people that are developing psychedelics for certain indications. So we have, we have uh, compass and we have those people that are going the conventional route to displace big pharma in, you know, what I believe are, are incredibly huge markets for depression, PTSD, right? And the third is actually producing, right? Am, am I right to look at this in, in, in sort of focus? These companies seem to have different, but, you know, very, very focused business plans. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think that's completely accurate. I would actually maybe even create a fourth bucket there that is the recreational uh, market. So your, your nutraceuticals and the guys who are going to kind of gray areas like the Netherlands and Jamaica and, and not legally um, selling these products. Very interesting. So you, you believe, what do you think that the path is going to be here? We've seen this, are we gonna see the path in America? So the rest of the world's one thing. So, you know, looking at phase two, phase three, conventional trials that are being done by so many, uh, oh, you know, like they, they, they're, we're starting to get some real interesting traction and interesting indications. Like, where would you, like, we cover Compass. I know you don't cover Compass. But where do you think is, where, where are you seeing the interest? Because you're taking the inbound institutional calls and they're asking you the same thing. Like, they're, where do I put my money? Like, where is the best bang for the buck? Like, where do you think this whole thing goes? And what are the institutions really targeting here? So the institutions obviously are going to be focused on the, the players that are performing, they're completely legal and above board. So they will not invest in anything recreational, I don't believe. Um, so you're looking at basically the clinics as well as the, the more like the biotech type psychedelic companies. Um, and, and I would say that the, to me, in my opinion, at least the better business model today are the drug developers versus the clinic companies. Um, and why is that? So the drug developers, they're targeting a market that we have previously speculated is worth around a hundred billion dollars globally. And these are, this is valued as what is the market for antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, all those drugs that, those chronic drugs that are treating this addressable population today. Um, these are drugs that you're on for the rest of your life. Can psychedelics come in and displace an antidepressant that you are, maybe you don't need to take this for the rest of your life now. Maybe you do, you do psilocybin once every year, every two years, um, alongside some psychotherapy, and that's all you need. So it's a very, very large addressable market that you're going after. And if they have better efficacy than standard of care today, today there's potential that that market grows in size because obviously the sale price could be a lot higher than what um, standard of care medicines generate today. They're mostly genericized. There's been very little innovation in the space. Um, they've been around for ages. So cost is quite, it's like a few dollars a day. It's, it's very, they're very affordable medications. Um, on the clinic side, so, so yeah, so going back to that, sorry, that's, I think institutions really understand that business model. It is exactly the same as any other biotech story. Um, so it's easy to wrap your head around, easy to value. On the other side of things, we have, we have the clinics. So the clinic chains, I would say are, they're almost entirely flo focused on ketamine today because ketamine is, is legal. It can be used as an anesthetic. Um, and most recently, J&J's drug called Spravato was approved for, for depression as well. So you can, you can use Spravato in these clinics. Now we've seen ketamine clinics pop up all over the US. They've just mushroomed, pardon the pun. Um, but I think the DEA will crack down on that because a lot of the ketamine is an off, it's off label unless you're using Spravato. Uh, racemic ketamine is used off label for depression. So it's not, you, you really need, I, I think, better um, 
better data and more more trial results to prove that it has the efficacy in order to be dosing patients as much as people are doing right now. So so I don't know if the DEA cracks down on these ketamine clinics, I think that that business model becomes a lot less viable. And I, I do agree with with the idea of building out a network of clinics and training therapists to administer psychedelics. My only question is, is it too early? So if these medications are not expected to come on the market until 2024, 2025 or later, should we be building out a network of clinics today to prep for that? I don't know. I don't know where the revenue comes from in, in the meantime. Um, is, is it best to wait until we actually get approvals, until we ensure that we do need to be dosing patients in, in the clinic with supervised administration? Perhaps we somehow find a way to modify these molecules where they can become take home in take home medications and you don't actually need a clinic infrastructure. So, so we just know it's too early to say yet, which is why I'm uh, myself as well as institutions, I think are a little bit more skeptical of the clinic model. Um, and then there's the, the other question when it comes to clinics, is there the potential to administer these medications to patients in an infrastructure that's already built? So I cover another company called Greenberg TMS. Uh, TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. It is a non-invasive way to treat treatment resistant depression. So if you've tried two, three, four lines of antidepressants and none of them seem to be working, you can go in for these uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation um, sessions where it's just like a helmet placed over your head and they de deliver magnetic uh, waves into your brain that have that they have very good efficacy comparable to um, electric shock for any of those that you remember who remember that so without that invasiveness delivering good efficacy um, that that business already has I believe it's 125 clinics across the US built out that are delivering TMS therapy. Now they're going to be starting um, a pilot project administering Spravato, the psychedelic. I think that's excellent. You're, you're both targeting that same treatment resistant depression patient. Um, and now you have two different therapies to offer that patient without the need to build out a whole separate uh, chain of clinics. You can do it right in that clinic infrastructure that's already built. Any other questions, Dave? No, there. I just found the unmute button. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. So this, as we unfold here, we're looking at the the, the catamine is legal now in Canada. So there's a, there's actually a clinic here in Alberta that's treating, or actually in Regina, that's treating people with catamine. Yep. So, how like do you think that that business? You know, your, your, your point is very valid. Now you can go and get treated for, with catamine for depression. So I guess the question is, how big is that market? How big is that addressable market? And is it only to people that are, uh, 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 what do they call it? Uh, they're not, uh, they don't respond to normal to, to regular prescription antidepressants, right? They're antidepressant resistant, I guess is what you say. Yes, so that, I, I will say that, like I said before, the, the ketamine clinic market has really exploded in the US and in Canada, they're all over the place. The problem with these medications is Ketamine, J&J's version of ketamine called Spravato has been FDA approved and they're working on reimbursement right now. So if you can, you can get um, CMS to approve your drug, if you can get private insurers to approve your drug, if you can get Health Canada um, to, not Health Canada to approve the drug, as well as the, prov the provinces to um, reimburse it, to list it on their formulary, then great. I think there's great adoption of that. There has been a problem for J and J to get widespread reimbursement for their drug because it is so expensive. You're paying anywhere from twenty thousand to thirty thousand a year just for the drug, not including that facility fee and that administration fee. So if if I'm not reimbursed for this, am I going to walk into a clinic and pay pay that amount of money out of pocket for this drug? Probably not. Um, ketamine, on the other hand, so the unapproved version, ketamine, ketamine. Um, 
this is what we're mostly seeing at all these clinics that are that are popping up. Now, the problem with that is racemic ketamine has not been approved to treat depression. It is being prescribed off-label for depression. Um, so if I go into a clinic and I say, I have depression, can this doc give me a prescription for it? They might be able to, my insurer might reimburse it. I, like there could be loopholes. For the most part, though, you're probably not going to get reimbursement. You're probably going to have to pay out of pocket. These sessions can cost uh, probably like around in the range of $500 a session, and you might need them weekly to begin with. Not as expensive, not nearly as expensive as J&J's drug, but still, still pricey. Or would I rather just take my, my normal antidepressant or try something like TMS that is reimbursed, that my insurer will pay for, that I don't have to pay for out of pocket? I think it's a lot more, that's, that's going to be the path that most patients take. Patients traditionally don't like to spend, uh, pay for these medical bills on their own when they can get alternative um, insurance coverage. So I, I don't think the market for ketamine is, is that big. I think the best path for these psychedelics to take is to go through FDA approval and then seek reimbursement. Once you get public and private reimbursement, that's when the market potential becomes enormous. And you believe we're really into 2024. We have some late stage phase twos, right? There's some interesting, there's some very interesting phase two studies underway right now. Which do you think is the leader in the candidates here on the anti-depression ADHD side? So on the on the depression side, um, mm -hmm. I would say is the furthest along. USONA is trailing a little bit behind them. USONA is going after a bigger market. So whereas Compass is targeting uh, treatment resistant patients. So these are patients who have tried, um, I believe it's at least two courses of antidepressants. And if you're a third liner later, you can take to Compass's drug. That's a lot smaller of a market. Now, maybe 30% um, response to the first drug, 30% respond to the second drug. You're maybe left with 30 to 50% of the market thereafter um, versus in targeting that entire 100% of the market. That's what USONA is doing. They're going after depression as a whole. Um, so much bigger opportunity, but they are, like I said, a little bit behind Compass. Um, in terms of ADHD, I haven't seen a ton of ADHD trials except for um, a mind medicines trial for ADHD, but that one's still in, uh, it's entering phase two, so still early. To, because these drugs are so, so efficacious and they are experiential and they cost so much money and the side effects, they, they are proven to be quite safe, but we, we don't know yet. We just don't know enough. I do think that the follow-up period for these patients after dosing them in clinical trials is going to probably be about a year. Um, so if we have to run phase three trials, typically the FDA requires two pivotal trials, so two phase three trials. Um, I don't see this taking, like this, this will likely take two years or longer to run these phase three trials. So add that to finishing up your phase two, enrolling patients for your phase three, and actually that adding on that six month review process at the end. Yeah, I think 2024 is actually a pretty aggressive <laughs> um, estimate, but if they can do it by 2024, that, that would be great. If the FDA grants them breakthrough therapy designation, accelerated approval, if they use any of those um, fast tracking mechanisms to get them through the clinic faster, then yeah, 2024, 2025, I think is reasonable. Do you see this, you know, I, I seem to see this as, so marijuana is going to be legal. Everybody yeah. rushes in you get this initial rush. Now, are we in the first, are we in the first inning? Are we in the third inning? Like, is this, we had, you know, quite a, quite a rush of capital that yeah. wanted to come in six months ago. Now we're right in the middle, right? Of, of experiencing another massive rush of capital coming into these stocks. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're obviously, uh, you know, the, the cart is in front of the horse here to, to use an old expression. You know, now we're going to have to play catch up or we just going to have a, you know, I'm not asking you to predict the market, but it just feels like we're going to have a series of rushes and, you know, mass enthusiasm and then not so much enthusiasm. 
I agree. So I think the sentiment around the space is so is so hyped up right now because one, mental health is on everyone's mind coming out of this pandemic. You've seen script numbers for, for antidepressants, for anti-anxiety drugs just skyrocket. Um, the, the prevalence rates are just, they're going up very rapidly. So we all know coming out of this pandemic, there's going to be a lot bigger of an addressable market to, to, to treat which is why I think people are so, and not just psychedelics, all mental health companies I think are doing, everyone's eyes are on them right now. Um, and then there's a, there's kind of a lack of public psychedelic companies out there. There are, I've seen over a hundred <laughs> private companies, but there's only something like, I think listed on the TSX that I'm actually paying, or TSX, NEO, CS, uh, Canadian Stock Exchange. Um, there, there's on well, well, well under a hundred. So there's, there's a lack of legitimate viable businesses, I think, that you can invest in. So the ones that actually make sense, like the compasses of the world who are already in clinical trials, money just piles into them. Um, I, I do not think this, and I'm, I'm biased, of course, I'm a healthcare analyst. Um, I do not think this market should be compared to cannabis whatsoever. It is not the same at all, apart from the fact that these are both they started off as illicit drugs. I think that's the only commonality. Um, cannabis does not cause the same physiological effects as psychedelics do. The same way that someone could smoke a joint and walk, walk to their friend's house, fine, that's perfectly safe. I don't think anyone could do LSD and be let out onto the street. There is, like you could get hit by a car, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. We should not be putting these, these medicines in people's hands recreationally. And I don't think that will ever happen. What happened in Oregon was um, actually quite a surprise to me. I don't, federally, I do not believe it will ever be legal. Um, so I think if the investors that are getting into this market thinking that it's going to be like cannabis, um, be, be weary. I, I would be a little bit more careful. I don't think it's gonna blow up the same way that cannabis has. I think it might at the beginning, keep going, keep running like this. And when people realize, wait, these drugs are all taking the FDA path to, to approval. This is actually gonna take four plus years to, to reach revenue positive. And even when we do, it's going to be incredibly regulated. Um, we'll probably see a correction. <laughs> That's good advice. That's good advice. To switch gears back to, I watched your uh, uh, the presentation you did, the day long presentation, the conference, and I'm looking at these things. Uh, uh, the very good food company came out of Western Canada. We're seeing such a plethora of alternative food companies, yeah. and it must be fascinating to see this industry start to bloom. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's it's but something. how much of, how much of this is really healthy? Like I've talked to people that are are very very conscious of diet. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff is really not that healthy, <laughs> according to them. You know, I'm I'm one of those people. I'm one of those people that goes to the grocery store and reads every single ingredient and everything I'm buying. So when I got pitched the idea of moving to Canaccord to cover wellness, I was very enthused by it. Um, I agree. A lot of these products aren't <laughs> healthy. <laughs> like the, the plant, the most, I'm not, I'm not gonna name names, but some of the most popular plant-based burgers and hot dogs have really terrible ingredients in them. Um, however, I don't think we're just catering to those, the health conscious population. We're also catering to the environmentally friendly population who cares that um, we can't keep eating meat because it takes a much bigger environmental toll. We, we like, think about the the land that it takes to for to raise cows the the land the water that they consume it, it's a lot more environmentally friendly to put plants in your burgers versus meat um and we're catering to the flexitarians too so not just those people who are not just the the vegetarians the vegans but also this new class of, of eaters who, who want to blend their diet. So I can be labeled as a flexitarian. I eat meat usually just on weekends and I reserve my weekdays for, for, for veggies. And whether it's healthy or not, like obviously, yes, I'd, I'd like to eat something healthier, but if I'm craving a burger on a weekday, um, will I have a Beyond Meat burger without thinking about what's in it? Possibly, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we need to look just at the health aspect 
When you are looking at these companies though, so I've seen an abundance of plant-based meat companies out there. Um, the, the demand is there, so it absolutely makes sense. A, a company that I cover that I really like called Else Nutrition is doing something a little bit different. So speaking to some of the experts in the industry, I asked what, what, what's the hardest, hardest food to make plant-based? Like I know people are trying to do cheese and, um, and uh, seafood, like these are all difficult. Apparently the one hardest product to make plant-based is infant formula. Because from the ages of zero to six, infant formula might be the sole source of nutrition for a child. Um, so you, have, you actually have to take this, this pro, any new plant-based product or any new product through, uh, through the FDA to get it certified. So it's quite an onerous product and it's quite hard to imitate um, breast milk using solely plant ingredients. There's very specific criteria that you need to follow, specific amino acid requirements, um, specific carb requirements. So it, it is quite complex. So, so looking for companies that are going after these untapped streams like infant formula and, and, and like cheese, um, ice cream, like a lot of dairy products that it, it's a little bit harder to make them vegan and still make them taste good. I think those are the most interesting because the, the meat market is quite saturated already. Very interesting. So, uh, Raheem, I think we'll just, that, that's all I have. Uh, Tanya, it must be fascinating to, to be in this sector. And now the investors, you know, like any typical new business, right? We're going to have cycles of overvaluation and undervaluation and some companies that won't make it. So we're very happy that you're here and, and we were able to reach out and, and ask you for some of your time. So in respect for that time, Raheem or Jeff, do we have any uh, questions in line? Uh, we have one question and uh, you know, fascinating conversation. I would say the one word that comes from psychedelics is complex. Uh, and the one word that comes from plant-based is opportunistic. In that sense, understanding that I'm a flexitarian uh, and I like both sides of the argument, are meat companies looking at plant-based companies as a potential revenue windfall down the road? Uh, are you seeing that kind of chatter in, in, in the uh, CPG space amongst uh, national companies who are, who are focused on what they're doing best? Uh, you know, we're in beef country here, so you know, that's top of mind, but we have an undercurrent as well. Uh, so can you see beef specific companies, uh, looking at plant-based as a potential, uh, complementary piece, uh, in the future as these companies start to emerge on the revenue side? 100%, 100%. The meat-based companies, I don't think are going to build out their own verticals to develop plant-based in-house, but I think they're going to wait and see at who succeeds and what, what plant-based names brands do best. Um, and I think they're going to acquire them. There's been a lot of M&A in the space. Um, look at like a company like Maple Leaf Foods, for instance, that is very meat focused. They have now entered the plant-based space. Um, so I do think it's going to be focused of all, for all meat and dairy based companies as well down the line. Do you think that the space is very heavily influenced by influencers as well? That's a question that, you know, was was presented uh, about 15 minutes ago uh, directly to me. Uh, it seems like there are certain advocates out there and what they say becomes gold and, uh, and people run to it. Uh, are you seeing uh, companies looking at influencers as a way to grow revenue and, and, and actually create demand? 100%, that's an excellent question and excellent point. I'd say like, look at the, look at the demographic that you're targeting they are the millennials and younger um we're, like we're the ones eating more plant-based um and we're all found on social media so yes i would say the influencers and social media play a very very big role in promotion I'll, I'll bring you guys back to this company that i just referenced else nutrition again um it's the the baby formula company starting out their sole source or their sole form of marketing has been social media and influencer based, not TV, not radio, no print, all social media. And they've had phenomenal success just using that one channel. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, Jeff, uh, some questions that have been posed there, if you just want to articulate them. I think a lot of them have been covered. So um, yeah, everyone's just shown support. Uh, they're really excited about the space, especially as 
how quickly it's evolving. I remember talking about Burkhan back in 2011 uh, oh. when they were introducing the the pre pro uh, the P protein and uh, one of their their old JVs and that. And it's amazing to see how much the space has developed and expanded uh, over these past nine years and um, the growth outlook for it. It's uh, it's quite compelling. Uh, we have one question that has been written, uh, Tanya. Uh, you can comment on, on Haven. I know it's not part of your uh, coverage space, although we may be restricted on it. Uh, secondly, something that uh, pretty easy for you to uh, summarize, how is a biotech company valued pre-earnings and what key factors should be reviewed? So maybe just the top pertinent one. Um, yes, great. So I'm, I'm not going to comment on Haven just in case we are restricted, um, but you're welcome to forward that individual's contact to me and I can talk to them offline. Um, in terms of valuing a biotech, um, so these these companies are, for the most part, pre-revenues. So you can apply a, a peer multiple, an EB to sales or EB to EBITDA multiple to them. So we run DCFs on these companies. So we take the drug, um, say we're treating, this is a drug looking at depression. How many people, what is the prevalence of depression in the major markets that you're gonna target? If you are going globally, those major markets are usually the US, um, the EU5, so Spain, Italy, France, um, the UK and Germany, um, as well as China, Japan. You take the prevalence rates in those markets. Um, what is the addressable market there? So if you're just targeting the third line market, let's say, so patients who have failed on one, two, and are now in their third course of trying, then, then you, you have to adjust for that. So how many third line patients are there? Um, and, and then you price it. So psychedelics, the one big difference I would say is, is the pricing scheme, whereas most drugs, it's quite easy to forecast for biotech companies. You just look at the standard of care. If the standard of care medicine is priced at $10,000 a year, most likely this new medication should be pricing somewhere in line with that, maybe a slight premium if the efficacy is much better. Um, but it's, it's quite simple to get a price estimate. For, for psychedelics, it's going to be vastly different because these are much more expensive medications, especially if you're getting psychotherapy alongside them. Um, so you have to factor in the cost. You have to factor in the potential that maybe these medicines are curative. So maybe you are not taking this every single year. Um, maybe you just need it once. Maybe this is a shrinking market now. So you have to factor in all of these things and, and then you can kind of get a sales estimate um, and then bring that sales estimate back to present value. Um, typically biotechs are, use a, a cost of capital anywhere in the range from let's say 10 to 12%, depending on how risky it is. Um, and then after you get that present value, you wanna further risk adjust that, that down by what phase of development in it, is it in? So let, if we look at a phase one drug, for instance, that drug has maybe a 10% chance of actually making it to commercialization. So if I think that stream of cash flows is worth $100 billion, I'm going to risk adjust it down by 90% to only be worth $10 billion because I, there's only a 10% shot of it actually making it. And then you can add in, add up all the costs or all, all the present values of those drugs to get an ultimate valuation. So not, so, not so simple. So I, I think we'll leave it there and uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, happy holidays to you. And uh, maybe we can have you back in uh, 2021 and uh, start to talk about an emerging economy uh, post pandemic uh, and see where things are going and then see how big your coverage universe gets by then. Yep, absolutely. I would love that. Right. Thanks. Thank you very yeah. much, Tanya, and the best of the season. You as well. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for attending. Look in your email in the coming days uh, for the replay information. And when you're thinking about your wealth, think my wealth, think my plan, and think my portfolio at mywealthmanager.com. Coming early 2021, stay tuned for more. Have a great day, everyone, and enjoy the holiday season. Bye for now.